Hello, good evening. Today is December 11th and it's close to 11 o'clock in the evening. Um, sorry, sorry, it's close to 10 o'clock in the evening. And I'm Bhavani Turaisingham. Uh, again, it's a US uh, standard time, which is uh, Dallas, Texas. And so um, I'm giving this placeholder presentation because tomorrow I will be giving a distinguished webinar on transportation system security. We are part of the US DOT University Technology Center on transportation system security. It's a $20 million center, and that is led by uh, Clemson University. Professor Mashur Roni Chowdhury is the leader, the director of the entire center. And I'm from University of Texas, Dallas, and we are uh, members of the center. So I'm giving this seminar or a webinar as part of our work for the center. It's called Tracer, T-R-A-C-R, -R, and that's Transportation, Cybersecurity, and Resilience. <laughs> okay, so uh, now I'm going to share my screen. Yes, it's being recorded, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so, um, right, so my, I'm sharing my screen, and I would like to, uh, let's see, right, this is the presentation. Okay, so the talk is Integrating Artificial Intelligence and Cybersecurity for Transportation Systems. Tracer, it's our national center for transportation, cybersecurity, and resilience, led by Clemson University. And we are a member university. I'm from the University of Texas at Dallas. Okay, so I believe I'm going to, um, yeah, I'm going to hide this. Okay, so outline. We've been doing a lot of work on AI and security for a, for a long time. And it's been funded, our prior work was funded by NSF, Air Force, Army, NASA, and so on. And so our work was on data privacy, malware analysis, applying machine learning for malware analysis, adversarial machine learning. It's joint work with my colleagues, Murad Kantarjulu and Latifa Khan. And then I did some work with my colleague. He was at UT Dallas. Now he's at uh, UC Santa Cruz, who is also part of our Tracer Center attacks to transportation. So I'm going to very briefly talk about our prior research because we are building our current research on Tracer for transportation systems, uh, on transportation system security for US DOT. So I'm going to talk about attacks to transportation system, and that's with Latifa Khan, and data privacy, Murad Kantajalu, and handling adversarial attacks. Also, Murad Kantajalu is leading that effort and I've been working with them. And then Dr. Fakans lead the effect, uh, effort on fairness. And then I'll be talking about how do you put this whole thing together? That's a challenge. Integrating with resilient as well as time critical systems, which is what I call safety. But again, the system has to recover from falls or continue operating even if there are falls and also meet timing constraints. Number of people I want to thank, especially USDOT, United States Department of Transportation for making our current work possible. And also Clemson University, Dr. Mashur Chowdhury, who is the uh, head of this, director of this entire center for including us in this project or the UTC and for providing strong leadership. Okay, prior research, it's just a sample. I'll talk about data privacy, malware analysis, and handling adversarial attacks. How do we bring in AI and security? Okay, so what we have done in the past is a lot, we've done a lot of work on data privacy. In fact, my colleague Murat is one of the top experts in this area. But one of the things that I've been involved with him is the privacy aware policy based quantified self. So one of the things is that quantified self is where sociologists and psychologists, they have uh, worked together to get information about, gather information about all the individuals and then analyze and give them advice, right? 
So for instance, say I like chocolate cake and vanilla ice cream and milk chocolates. And so when I open, you know, fortunately I don't put anything, I don't keep anything in the refriger refrigerator, but say I open the refrigerator and I take some vanilla ice cream or milk chocolates, wouldn't it be great if the system would tell me, no, you're not supposed to eat that, right? So it's gathering information, health, fitness, location, all kinds of information, some of into a smartphone, some data cloned in the cloud, encrypted, and some of the data anonymized. So uh, the thing is, imagine what's happening, right? All this information being collected and what happens if they send it to my insurance company or whatever, and they find that I'm eating all the time, you know, chocolates and vanilla ice cream. I mean, that's that would be horrible. And so my privacy has to be maintained. So one of the things that we looked at when we designed and developed the system is policy aware. Policies have to guide everything, right? So when we collect the data, how long are we going to collect the data? How long are we going to keep the data, right? Uh, whether, how are we going to store it? What sort of analytics are we going to carry out? Uh, with whom are we going to share the data, right? So this is a system we designed. Uh, and so this is, and the reason I'm mentioning it, it, it is somewhat relevant, I would say, to some of the work on privacy for transportation systems. Okay, so the next topic I'll talk about, again, very briefly, each topic we have a, a whole presentation, okay? So very briefly, uh, the next topic is uh, big data stream classification for cybersecurity. So what do we do? Lots of, what is stream? Data is continuously arriving, nonstop, right? So it could be transportation data, it could be cyber attack data, whatever. Sensor data continuously arriving. That means it's big data, continuous flow of data, massive amounts, and it's very common, right? It always happens. And so, and also if a financial data, it's continuously arriving. So what do we do? One model does not fit all. So for instance, in the financial world, yesterday, say we, we advise uh, people to buy, our customers to buy Microsoft. Today, it's Google. Tomorrow, it could be Apple. The next day, it could be Facebook. So models are changing. So 20, 30 years ago, we were doing this work, but then we just had one model. We couldn't adapt the model in real time something we have to do today. So what did we do? We were among the first to build an ensemble of models, a collection of models. And the models are continuously getting updated. So the models talk to each other and then they find one model is no, no longer useful. So we, these models throw that model and then continue. So it's continuously evolving so that the concepts, the new concepts are incorporated so that we can give good advice to our customers or whoever is using the system, right? So if there's attack traffic coming in, the models are changing, right? And then if it's attack, we quarantine and we block, otherwise it's benign traffic. So we've applied this uh, system for a number of applications, analyzing malware for insider threat and so on, okay? And so this is something that we are looking at right now for transportation data. Okay, the other, so here we are talking about attack data is arriving. So systems have been attacked. It could be networks, it could be operating system, it could be whatever. But here we are talking about the machine learning algorithms because whether we like it or not, AI and machine learning are here to stay, right? For practically every application we are using machine learning and AI. What happens if our machine learning techniques are attacked, algorithms? We cannot depend on uh, what it's going, the results, right? If these systems are attacked, uh, instead of saying that you have diabetes, it's saying that, uh, you know, you have got cancer and treating you for cancer and not for diabetes. That could be deadly. Or instead of telling you that you are going at 60 miles per hour, it's telling you it's okay, you can drive faster because you're only going 20 miles per hour. You don't know, then you speed up, you could get into a crash, right? So machine learning algorithms are being attacked. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the adversary is learning about us. We are, we have to learn about the adversary. Adversary. So this is adversarial learning. It's not concept drift like what I said earlier. Concepts are not changing. It's not learning all online. Adversary adapts to avoid being detected during training time, 
data could be poisoned during test time. We can modify, they can modify the features. So essentially it becomes gameplay. So here's a support vector, for example, support vector machine is a machine learning algorithm. The red uh, squares are bad instances. The blue circles are good instances. See what happens. The bad instances, they're learning about the algorithms. They know that this is the line for support vector machine boundary. It's pushing all the bad instances, one, two, three, four, five. They are not caught, right? Because they know exactly where our boundary line is. So what do we do? So here I've slightly switched it, by the way. The red crosses are bad. The green circles are good. And the dotted line, the black dash line, is the support vector machine boundary. So the threat model, uh, test time deployment, attacker can modify x to x prime, modify packet length by adding dummy bytes, good word to spam email, number of things. What we are trying to do, see what the, what the uh, attacker is doing, see all these pluses, right, are considered to be good because they are with the green circles, right? So this is our boundary line here. Below the boundary is bad, above the boundary is good. What we are going trying to do, and it's better shown here, we, are, <clears throat> we do some calculations, lots of math involved, and it's again meaningful calculations, and we are moving this dash boundary line, right, to this blue line. So that means this is our new boundary line. That means the attacker at this point does not know. So all of these bad instances uh, will be considered to be bad instances. Otherwise, they would be good instances, right? And so you could ask the question, we can move the boundary line right here. But if you do that, we are not only going to have false, we are going to have false negatives and false positives, right? A lot of these green circles are good, but they're going to show as bad. And we cannot have false positives and false negatives, right? So the blue line is the adversary. So the whole challenge is where do you place the blue line? So in time, the adversary will know what we are doing. And so it sort of becomes game playing. So this is the paper that we published at KDD, Knowledge Discovery. It's the top, one of the top two uh, data, con data mining or data science conferences. And we were among the first. It was funded by the Army. We were among the first I believe, to publish this kind of work, adversarial machine learning. Okay, now, uh, then with Alva, so that was our work on AI and security, right, the sample. Then uh, Dr. Alvaro Cardenas, who is a top expert in cyber physical systems, and so he and I, he was with our, at our university, and so he and I co-supervised a student, Dr. Raul Cunenes, and that's when I got into transportation system security about six years ago. So here we are not using any AI. So it's transportation, Internet of Transportation. This is Internet of Home things where our television is talking to our clock and microwave and so on. But here cars and trucks and trains. And so they're all talking to each other. OK, so what's the problem? We, these systems could be attacked, right? Because, you know, there could be malicious software. So cars talking to trains, talking to trucks, you know, all of this data, sensor data could be attacked. So what did we do? Right. So what we did, so we learned various types of attacks. So we published two papers, one uh, at the Usenex uh, security, and that's a top uh, one of the top four cybersecurity conferences. And this was also part of ACM CCS, a small uh, a mini conference part of CCS. That's another top cybersecurity conference. But ours here was in the uh, a mini track on cyber physical systems. And so what did we do? So you could ask. Right. So. Uh, okay, so first we did offline pre-processing, right, for autonomous vehicles. The invariants are calculated using well-known nonlinear models. So that's a challenge to capture this physical part of the system, right? So I'm a computer scientist, but Dr. Cardenas, he was a con is a control systems engineer and a cybersecurity expert. So we need this interdisciplinary expertise. So, so he came up with this model. So accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, sensor data on the X, Y, and Z axis is used for aerial vehicle, vehicle positioning and steering is for the ground vehicle. Okay, so the online stage, uh, we didn't go for fancy AI, you know, at the time, because this work was done around 2018. And so we went with uh, what engineers would go typically, extended Kalman filter to use to predict AV's physical behavior by estimating unknown parameters from noisy sensor inputs. 
Okay, so our algorithm, it's into two sections. It predicts and corrects the estimation before it is compared against the sensor data. Okay, so it's, it's fairly standard, but again, it was one of the early works that integrated transportation systems and security. So the anomaly detection, uh, the CUSUM, CUSUM algorithm is used, a statistical approach to detect persistent attacks. And we raise an alarm if the residual difference is larger than a predefined threshold, okay? So we didn't use AI. It was just a very nice experiment um, that our student, students carried out. Okay, the physical implementation, you know, this could work for drones, uh, that's the air, and land, uh, so that's uh, cars. So we just tested for cars and the drones, not boats or submarines. <clears throat> so aerial AV, uh, ready to fly drone controller. This is the controller we use focused on detecting. So what's the attack? GPS spoofing, right? So it's a global positioning system spoofing and gyroscope attacks. So GPS attacks were detected after 0 0.2 seconds while gyroscope attacks are detected after 1.5 seconds. So overhead was quite a bit, five point something. So for ground, we used custom built on top of Traxi Ford Fiesta a uh, controller was ROS Kinetic came and we focused on detecting visual attacks on the camera, attacks detected after 0 0.1 second and overhead was less, about 2%. So each threshold produces uh, a probability of false alarms uh, is about 2%, right? So again, the 2% these days, you know, those days 10% was okay, but today 2% is high. You know, we really need almost zero, right? False alarms, 0%. Okay, so, so that was our work in a snapshot because we are coming to this project with some vast experience on AI and security as well as on transportation system security, right? And so, so how do we put all this together and what's the next step? And that is our work, at least our team's work on um, the, our tracer research. So we have done a number of projects and, and we, it's just the beginning, right? We started this work only very recently. So there's so much more for us to do over the next uh, several years. So I'm going to talk about a number of topics. Attacks on smart cars, right? And that's led by my colleague, Latifa Khan. Then data privacy, that's led by my colleague, Murat Kantajalu. Adversarial attacks, also led by my colleague, uh, Murat Kantajalu. And we are combining adversarial machine learning and privacy Murat Kantajalu and uh, uh, Alvaro Cardenas, and fairness, right? Because you don't want to discriminate against certain individuals or certain groups, right? When they are driving, give them speeding tickets and whatnot. And so fairness, and the biggest challenge I see, each individual, individual part is very challenging. How do you integrate all of this together? Okay, so first, handling attacks on smart cars. So with cars becoming increasing, all the smart vehicles, right, increasingly connected, they have become both smarter and more susceptible to attack. The more connected you are. Sometimes I wish that we could go back to 1970 or 1970, we already had the internet, right? 1960, then we wouldn't have to worry about any of these things. Okay, design robust intrusion detection system against attacks on the CAN bus, right? So CAN bus is sort of an essential component uh, of these uh, smart cars. As a central communication system in a smart car detected any potential attacks on the CAN bus is really important, right? So standard CAN frames in vehicles like encryption or authentication, this is sort of a CAN frame. So you have a CAN ID, these are four bit DLC, the payloads and the CRC checksums and so on. Typical, right, uh, 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 frame. Right. So as we speak, one of my colleagues is presenting. It's a very fairly good conference. Uh, uh, and it's uh, on this particular work, Secure Smart Vehicles Through Federated Learning. So I'll tell you what we did. OK, so next what we said, said, OK, so there are many things that we can do. We can bring in our machine learning algorithms to detect these attacks. Right. So that's one one area of research. But one thing I wanted to mention this federated learning is becoming really important. It started back in the old days with federated data management and federated systems, a group of people working together, but each one having its autonomy. 
So what we are saying in reality, car manufacturers collect their own data independently. This data often includes sensitive information like CAN IDs, making manufacturers reluctant to share it. Because sharing, I mean, you, the government can say share all your cybersecurity data. But again, you know, companies are very reluctant to share. So, and especially, you know, they don't want to share. For one thing, they don't want to tell people their attack. And they don't want to tell others about their, uh, about their inventions and their innovations. So what we are saying is, Okay. Consequently, a centralized model relying on a single local data set would miss valuable training data. So we have a centralized model, right? We won't have any training data. We will miss it due to privacy concerns. Therefore, we will need some sort of federated approach. What is federated? Each manufacturer, right, is uh, developing the models for the attack. So there's denial of service, proofing, whatnot, right? Uh, fuzzing attacks and where manufacturer end has its own attack. So they're all uh, developing these, uh, I mean, developing models to detect these attacks. And they are only publishing their model. They are not publishing the types of attacks or anything. So each manufacturer, that's federated, each manufacturer is publishing its model. And then all of these models are collected. And the central server is performing the aggregation to carry out uh, you know, machine learning to determine these attacks at the global level, okay? So federated learning provides an effective solution, right? In federated learning, multiple client devices have their own local data and train individual local models, which are then combined. We adopt a cross-silo federated learning where we have a limited number of clients, right? Each representing a car manufacturer, right? You could have Ford, you could have, I don't know, Toyota, and um, GM, right, each manufacturer. And then there is this global model that's doing further analysis of these various uh, attacks. Okay, so this paper, it's a very recent paper and it's being presented right now. One of my colleagues, Murat, actually Latifa Khan is presenting this paper. It could, I, it's I think today is when he's presenting it. Okay, so, so we developed this, what is this paper about? It's a solution called Fast SV, okay, Fast, I think it's Smart Vehicles, a solution based on augmented sharing. So what do we do with augmented sharing? So what happens here, right? We have multiple clients, right? Client one, client two, client three, client four. And so we have triplet mix up on data set. Triplet mix up is sort of a term that we are using sort of in machine learning, deep learning. And from there, we are generating synthetic data. And when I talk about data privacy, we'll talk more about synthetic data. It's very, very useful because we also want to maintain the privacy. Okay, so triplet augmentation to generate artificial samples at the client side. So at the client side, so you have synthetic data and then they all come to the central server. So we are, what the clients are doing is, uh, uh, you know, they are sort of hiding some of the private sensitive information and the private information and so on. And they are augmenting it with synthetic data and uh, generating the synthetic data. And so the central server, all the synth synthetic data goes to the central server. And now what happens is we have what we call a class balanced synthetic data. Okay. And so what happens is that it's more balanced and the synthetic data is being shared between these different, uh, you know, balanced synthetic data is what the central server is doing, balancing it, and then sending it to the, uh, to the various, uh, you know, clients, the same clients, but since it's doing some massaging, and then it's sending it to the clients, and then the client can build their own models. Okay, so systematically shares limited quantities of artificial samples among the clients. Optionally, it can add noise for added protection. And so that data is now given to the clients and the clients are now working with their data. So that's the fast SV is the solution based on it sort of augmented. So we're augmenting the actual data and then sharing the augmented data and then the clients are working with the augmented data. So that's what uh, we are presenting our most recent work. Okay, now we move on to data privacy. So again, this whole idea of synthetic data 
right? What we are focusing here, and actually some of the techniques that we are going to we are developing here could be used here as well, okay? So this is really focusing on data privacy uh, and how do you hide all the sensitive information? So you have all these data sets. This is really, really uh, intricate, actually, this particular piece of research. And so we have these data sets, right? And what are we trying to do? From these data sets, we want to generate synthetic data sets because whenever we publish these data sets, they have to be private. So we're collecting lots of data, right? It could be trans driver, driver vehicle patterns and attack patterns and various data. We want to maintain the privacy. We want to maintain the sensitivity. So we cannot share this data where it is. So we have to generate synthetic data that's also very real because it has to have high utility. What's the point in generating synthetic data when it's of no point, right? When it's completely different. So we have deep learning models that we are using, deep, deep learning, taking these data sets. And these deep learning models are learning about these data sets and trying to figure out how do we adapt this data and generate synthetic data so that the data is still going to be useful. So it's learning from these data sets, generating these models, and from these generated models, based on what it has learned, it's now adding some noise and various other things and generating this synthetic data set. So a number of people have developed uh, such approaches, including us in the past. But what we have done is integrating this deep learning with differential privacy. That's a measure of privacy that is the strongest to date. We have different types of privacies. We have privacy definitions. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, you know, K-anonymity, L-diversity, T-closeness. And so what we are trying to do is to generate the synthetic data sets that are differentially private. And it's not differing that much in the sense that all those sensitive information has been uh, removed, it's still being useful. Because what's the point in having data that is not useful? So how are we doing it? So we have this data set D. Okay, so we partition it into K um, subsets, right? So D1, D2, and so on up to DK. We take each of these DIs, and then we what do we what do we do? Differentially, DP is differentially private auto encoding. Auto encoding is a deep learning method, and so deep learning again is uh, you know it's a multiple layers of learning. Simply put, okay, so. It's each, each one is uh, being, we apply auto encoding with differential privacy and generate the, uh, the hat uh, I. And we collect all of this, then we get the synthetic data. What is the challenge? The challenge is this auto encoding. So this is what the auto encoding does for us. Okay. So what does it do, this auto encoding? Uh, so we have it's it's a, a complicated algorithm, right? So what happens is that we have encoding and then we have decoding, number of layers. That's where the deep learning comes in. DPEM is differentially private, expected maximization. And so that is the algorithm that we are using in order to auto encode and learn. So it'll take me a while to sort of explain. So in, in summary, this is the, mo the module, right, that is doing the auto encoding and ensuring that it's differentially private. So every, so we are learning, the, the, the deep learning is learning from this data, various features, relationships between the features, and then it knows what, what are the sensitive features and so on. We are feeding in a lot of information, all the, the sensitive features, and then it's trying to uh, modify it to be differentially private, but also it has to be useful. So that's what it's doing here, okay? Although this paper was published, you know, like five years ago, we are now examining this, uh, this work and how can we apply this, right? We are to uh, transportation data. So our data that we used, a lot of our data has been with healthcare and various other applications. So now we want to take this algorithm is it going to work for transportation data? And is it going to work, okay, for 
uh, I mean, how does it compare with the work that other people are doing? So that's going to be a challenge, okay, for the data privacy. Now, remember I mentioned, showed another aspect. This is something that I would like to pursue and hopefully with someone who is also, I mean, our team, uh, not just at UT Dallas, the entire team has such fantastic expertise. We've got policy experts, we've got risk analysts. And so, you know, for example, University of Alabama, they're very well, you know, ex they're strong expertise in policy. So I'd like to work with them. And instead of collecting healthcare data and so on, we collect radar data, GPS cameras, leader, ultrasonic sensors, data collection, storage, and so on. And then we want to analyze these kinds of data applying machine learning, right? Similar to what we did for our healthcare. How can we do it in this particular case? But the challenge for us, at least for me, is what are these policies? I can't really make up policies. Now for our other project, uh, initially when we, when we were working on policies, we computer scientists came with TOY, T-O-Y policies. But now we are working with the policy expert at our university, not on this project though, uh, she's the dean of uh, our policy school, but fortunately for uh, for Tracer, we do have policy experts, so we'd like to work with them and get some ideas on how to uh, what sort of policies we need for collecting and storing and analyzing. Okay, okay. So now I'm going to move on to adversarial attacks. Remember, I mentioned about the adversarial attacks earlier. So what happens if our machine learning techniques are attacked? So what happens here? We have a stop sign some or other that stop sign, whatever algorithms that are going in there is man being manipulated and some stickers are posted, okay? So manually posted, but it's more electronically, they, are, they could be posted. So instead of saying stop, okay, people could read it as speed limit is 30 kilometers or speed limit is 80 kilometers or speed limit is 50 kilometers and wild animals are crossing, all kinds of fake things are being uh, fake things are being displayed. So test time attacks against ML models used in self-driving cars, attacks against sensors used to modify traffic. Our work developed robust, te robust techniques, robust support vector machines. That's, we talked about it earlier. And another approach that I think that's quite useful is randomization approaches to prevent transferability. And I'll explain what we mean by that. Okay, if the population of the hypothesis in the variant space is a large variance, there's more room for random randomization. What do we mean by that, okay? So remember the same picture. Uh, we are not using support vector machine here, but what is happening here is that the population, there's a large variance. They're not sort of close to each other. So we have a lot of flexibility in coming up with this adversarial uh, machine learning models, right? So it can be here, these lines can be here, anywhere, and it would work. But in this case, we don't. We are, when they are very close to each other, you know, it's harder. Now, what we mean by, okay, what we mean by this transferability is that when we use the data, same data set, right? When we have different deep learning models using the same data sets, right? They would come up with some similar results. So what we want to do is we want to randomize these deep learning uh, models so that you know, they, they can handle such situations, okay? So, so what we mean by that is exploring the effect of randomization on transferability of adversarial samples against the particular deep learning model we use was deep uh, technique was deep neural networks. Okay, so how do we randomize, right? So we could do, the whole idea is that we select these deep learning models randomly. So we can add a random noise to the input, X becomes X plus Delta X, or the model parameter, sorry, the model, model parameter could change from theta to Delta theta, input and model parameters, so X to Delta X and theta to Delta theta, and what's our goal? to detect, right, any of these uh, attacks and to classify and make it harder to attack multiple self-driving cars, okay? So essentially what these deep learning models would do is that whatever applies to one car can apply to 
all the cars, right? With one model, they can apply to all the cars. Okay? And that is what we don't want to happen, right? So what we, just like Sophia randomization has been applied in the past, we are applying randomization to these deep learning models, right? So if you have one model, right, we can attack many cars. But what we want to do is randomize these models. We have multiple models so that it's going to be harder to attack. So that's the whole idea. So we demonstrate that introducing randomness to DNN models can break the curse of the transferability of adversarial attacks, given that the adversary does not have an unlimited attack budget. The adversary, of course, is really wealthy, can do lots of stuff, then it can figure out the randomization. Okay, so that's the one solution that we are applying, uh, especially for cars, it's going to, this, this might be a, a promising direction. Okay, another thing that is between Murat, my colleague Murat and um, Alvaro, uh, and this is also a top tier, there are top uh, cybersecurity conferences. One is IEEE SNP, ACM CCS, Usenet Security, and NDSS. So this was published in NDSS. And this is adversarial machine learning and privacy for cyber physical uh, systems. Okay, so this is very interesting. Consumer data protection protected by differential privacy. So as I said, differential privacy is become really uh, very important. I mean, that's the best privacy guarantee we can have. If you say that this uh, data set is differentially private, then you can have some assurance that sensitive information uh, has been removed. So our adversary, right, they're trying to do data poisoning and they are trying to hide the attacks with the noise that we are adding to differential privacy. Remember, whenever you have pri private privacy preserving data sets, we have added some kind of noise. And our work, we can't just randomly add noise. We have to add noise in such a way that privacy is preserved. That's what differential privacy does. So what the, so our goal is to minimize the attacker's ma maximum achievable payoff. So how to detect attacks while protecting privacy? So let's see what's happening. So we have database, right, D1, D2, and Dn, and we are applying differential privacy. So why we are, we are querying, and the actual response is why, applying differential privacy, the data set is Y prime, or Y hat, or whatever, Y bar. So here is the attacker, it knows Y bar, and what, it's, what is it doing? It's doing Y bar A, okay, which is, it has, because we're adding this noise, Y to Y bar, it's attacking this and Y bar A, right? So the, it may not be differentially private anymore, right? So for instance, you can have all these smart grids and cars, so a number of sensors and here, there's no attack. It's differentially private. The sensor data is also differentially private. But sensor two and sensor three, the attacker has attacked, right? And so we cannot trust whatever, whatever is coming out of here. So again, our goal is to minimize the attacker's maximum achievable payoff. So how to detect attacks? Well, so we want to protect the privacy, but because we have added noise for differential privacy, that attacker is able to exploit that and change that, right? So we want to minimize the attacker's maximum uh, achievable payoff because the attacker is trying to maximize whatever is in here and do the attack. So we want to minimize what the attacker is capable of doing. So that's this paper, adversarial classification under differential privacy. So now, so what we have done here, or at least Murat and uh, uh, Alvaro, what they have done is, is a really nice thing because what they have done is integrating adversarial attacks with data privacy, right? <clears throat> so we want to have systems that are that that don't attack the machine learning model. So we prevent or we detect the machine learning model attacks, but sometimes this particular thing can cause privacy violations. So we're integrating. How can we also achieve privacy? So that's what we are trying to do here. Okay. So now we move to the last part, okay? And that is fairness for transportation. Okay, so what is fairness? 
Autonomous vehicles often need to perform various automated functions. We know that. Consider an autonomous vehicle. Try to classify with an object in the vicinity. Is it a pedestrian or is it not? Okay. So the object classification needs to be accurate regardless of the race, gender, age of the individual being classified. Because sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes if you use, say, race, right, then you are always detecting the pedestrians who are of a particular particular race, maybe the disadvantaged minority community, right? So we have to accurately predict, and regardless of the gender or age. Previous studies have found significant fairness issues, and this is a really a good paper, not by us. They talked about all the problems that can, the fairness issues in automated pedestrian detection systems, right? So they have looked at all the transportation data. They have not come up with solutions. They have looked at transportation data, and they have identified all the problems that could happen. So it's important to build systems that counter these issues, right? So. Pre predicting pedestrians, right? Do we correlate it with race, gender? That's not, that's an unfair dependency. If you correlate pedestrian, uh, uh, predicting pedestrians with race and gender, it's an unfair correlation. We don't want that. So sensitive feature, for example, is S, right? Race, gender, Pedest prediction is, is it pedestrian or not? And other features, an image of the object or some individual. So we don't want the prediction to be based on race, gender, or even age. So we want a fair, bias-free prediction model. Now, we can't completely eliminate race and gender in many cases, right? They play a role, but we don't want it to depend entirely, right? It's an unfair dependency. It can contribute some. So that is the research. How much does it contribute and what other features do we want to incorporate? The dependency effect of sensitive features to predicted outcome is eliminated or restricted to an acceptable fairness level. Okay, so that's our goal. Okay, so we come, came up with the protocol of fairness so we are learning. And this protocol is generic enough. We were able to test it with some uh, Chicago crime data. But next step for us is to test it with some transportation data. Hopefully, what we are planning to do is to talk to the authors of these people of this paper and try and get some of their data and see whether our algorithm works. So what do we do? It's a, quite an intricate algorithm. Okay. So what is our learner trying to do? So it is a multitask approach. The tasks are arriving sequentially. Remember continuous learning, online learning. We are learning online. See, what we can easily do is take everything offline and learn, but it's not going to help us, isn't it? If you want to detect a pedestrian right there when we are driving. So it's a machine is constantly learning online. So data is arriving, streaming data, sensor data. So T equals one, we learn the number two. And the model parameter, theta one. T equals two, we learn four, model parameter, theta two. So tasks are arriving, tasks are D, Set of tasks are D1, D2, D3, and so on. They're arriving sequentially. Okay? Set of tasks, DT, T equals 1, 2, T. So that's what the learner is doing. Now, what is our algorithm? And I'll show you in the next, uh, uh, next chart too. Before that, the sensitive features could be color, right? Prediction, our uh, prediction is digits 2 and 4. Okay? So maybe the skin color of the person. Right? Is it a dark person? Is it a light skinned person? So that's sensitive. Okay. And so we don't want this to be depending entirely on the sensitive feature. So, step one, the learner selects initially some sort of theta value, right? The model parameter uh, in the fair domain. So, that is the challenge for us. Okay. So, initially, we initialize theta one and we apply theta one to the task D1, right? Time equals T1. So, the task is D1. And then step two, the loss function, right? Whenever the learner, right, there's some loss, accuracy is lost, and the fairness function. So there is a calculation, uh, an algorithm that we have used to co compute the fairness, and they are calculated. Okay. So step three, the learner incurs, so applying this to task, incurs an instantaneous loss. And the fairness notion. So again, loss and fairness are tightly integrated. We want to maximize fairness and minimize the loss because we can't 
by bringing all these features, we can't afford to lose the accuracy, right? So loss of accuracy, minimize, and the fairness, maximize. Then we go to the next round, T equals T plus one. So this was also published in KDD. That's the number one, as I said, data science conference, right? We, we typically, we always publish, my colleagues and I, you know, we publish in places like KDD, AAAI, ICML, and ICDM, and, and so on, okay. So our algorithm is called Fair Dolce. So this is what happens at theta one. Now, I know this is, looks very uh, colorful, but it's, I'll explain to you. So the learning networks, right? So we have learned uh, at T1, it's learning two. T, uh, so the model parameters is theta one, but you can see theta one has got different, different uh, parameters that are combined. T2 is learning four. Another environment, uh, this environment, so remember cars are changing. Right, I mean, the scenario is changing. It could be rainy, it could be dark, it could be cloudy, it could be bright sunshine, it could be snowy. So another environment, it's learning, it's learning. And then the last environment also, it's learning. Okay, so it's a two-stage protocol. Remember, T equals one initialize, we develop this uh, FNG, right? If it's, if it's fine, then we stop, but it's not okay for us. It, you know, the error is maybe too much, and the accuracy you know, may not be there, and the fairness, it may not be fair. Okay, so, uh, so what we do is uh, we take the tasks, D1 to DT minus one, up to time T minus one, we apply our algorithm. This is the, the crux of this problem is applying this algorithm, this machine deep learning algorithm, and we get the model parameter theta T. Okay, so now we apply theta T to task DT, and then we get the new sets of what the loss function and the fairness function, the computations. And then we repeat, 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 repeat 5,000, 10,000 until we get satisfactory performance and results or say 10,000 iterations. So what is this algorithm? How do we develop, uh, come up with this model parameter? That is where we apply this uh, representation, two types of networks. We apply representation learning networks and prediction learning networks. And so there are various encoders and decoders, just like what I explained earlier in deep learning. So that, I mean, it'll take a long time for me to explain this, but this is the algorithm, the deep learning algorithm that we are applying to develop these model parameters. Okay. So this paper, as I said, was published in CKDD. And so this is the fairness now, we would like to apply this to transportation data, but we haven't done that yet. That's sort of going to be the next step for us. In the meantime, for the paper at least, because we didn't have transportation data, but we are going to get it from hopefully these people and some others. So, and we'll also talk to Dr. Chowdhury. And so, for example, I'll just talk about this. Our algorithm is called Fair Dolce, okay? And so we compare it with the demographic parity, right? Chicago crime data. Now, the thing is we want to find uh, the correlations, right? Who are the people who are committing crime? But we don't want to look at race or even gender, right? Underrepresented minority community male, right? We don't want that, but we want other features too. So we are applying this algorithm to Chicago crime data and our algorithm is fair dolce. And as you can see, it is outperforming several of the other algorithms because some of the other algorithms, algorithms are using some very simple machine learning techniques. And so, we, I mean, based on our extensive experience using deep learning, deep learning really, it has really revolutionized, right, machine learning. So ours was purely based on deep learning and it's uh, outperforming uh, the other you know, the other, the results. So our, so our method can sequentially adapt both fairness and model accuracy for changing environments. Our method outperforms competing techniques. And next step, of course, we have to apply our approach to the transportation data. Okay, so I'm almost done. Um, yeah, I mentioned I will finish in about 50 minutes and so we can have a discussion. So the last challenge, right? I mean, the last thing, this is the biggest challenge we are going to be faced with. 
yes, we can talk about security, we can talk about privacy, we can work on fairness, there's also these adversarial attacks. I haven't talked about integrity. You know, we've done a lot of work on data provenance. Where did all these data come from? How accurate is the data? So, okay, data provenance. Uh, so all of that, right? We can work on individual, like in individual boxes and we can, you know, like in silos, we can work. But eventually what we need is integrating all of these features, okay? And remember, our project is not just security, it's also resilient. Resilient system, these systems have to continue operating in the midst of attacks. So we did some work for the Air Force a long time ago, actually, uh, probably about I don't know, eight, nine years ago. What happens that if the system, uh, if the system has crashed, right? The operating system has crashed, mind you, and these applications have to somehow or other continue operating and then slowly come to a halt, not crash. Like airline systems, what happens if there's a major failure, right? Does the plane crash? No, what you really want is to, uh, to maneuver and land the plane safely, okay? So that's what we mean resilience. So it has to continue operating in the midst of attacks. How can we apply that to transportation? And real-time systems, they have to meet timing constraints, right? Transportation, these are some of them are time-critical systems. So transportation systems often have to handle both challenges, resilience, timeliness. We have studied approaches for integrating security and real-time processing. This was when I was at MITRE Corporation. We worked on the, it was kind of ancient stuff because it's like 30 years old. How do you bring in security and real-time processing? But things have advanced so much now, okay? So we have also studied how computing systems can continue operating in the midst of false and attacks. That's the work we did for the Air Force. Uh, that was about 10 years ago. So, and then there is integrity, right? Data provenance. Where did the data come from? What's the quality of the data? Is the data accurate? That's also an issue, which I have not talked here in this presentation. So the challenge that we are going to have is how do we integrate transportation systems that have to be resilient, meet real-time constraints, ensure integrity, security, privacy, fairness? Can we do something, some of these things in hardware, right? Part of our work, we have used uh, the Intel SGX platform to carry out many of our operations. What do we do there? And also, there is this whole area of security governance, right? So when, when, we, when we do CISSP, right, the first thing that we study is um, governance. And they teach governance sort of in business schools, right? So what are the, what sort of governance framework should we have for security? And that's something we need to examine for transportation systems. But there's also AI governance. What about explainability? And what about uh, privacy issues? What about security? Everything that we that we talked about, right? What are some of the regulations? Because you can't, you know, work on this in isolation. We've got to also understand what these policies and regulations are. And so how can we bring all of this together, AI security governance framework for transportation systems? So that is a kind of a major challenge. Okay, so in summary, we first presented our prior work on integrating AI and security as well as transportation system security. So we've done, I would say like decades of work. You know, I got into this area in 1985 fall when I joined Honeywell in cybersecurity, integrating cybersecurity and data management. We didn't even call it computer security and data management. Then at MITRE, it was information security and data mining. And then cybersecurity was with, when I was with NSF, it was still into data mining, but now, you know, cybersecurity and data science, cybersecurity and ML, but now cybersecurity and AI or trustworthy AI, fine. So we've done a lot of work. And then next we examined our current research and its application to transportation systems. So we talked about attacks to transportation systems. That was a CAN bus example and the federated learning. Then we talked about data privacy in particular. Uh, how do we apply deep learning, right? To extract all these patterns to learn about the data and how can we best publish differentially private data? But this differential privacy, oh, sorry, 
And then, okay, then we talked about adversarial attacks, right? With all these, uh, you know, what, what these uh, vehicles could do, uh, these deep learning models, right? These attacks on one vehicle can be transferred to another vehicle. And so these are transferable. So what do we do there, right? So I talked a little bit about that. And then we said by, by differential, because of differential privacy, right? The attacker can take advantage of the noise and switch that, you know, attack that noise. And so we will not know because we know, okay, that's a noise that we have added, but the attacker has manipulated that noise. So the data is not going to be differentially private. So that's a problem. And of course, I talked about fairness. So we will be exploring in depth many of the concepts discussed in this presentation for transportation systems under Tracer. And so hopefully we'll have, you know, we'll have a lot of progress uh, to report uh, next year this time. Um, and the challenge now, as I said, is how do we integrate transportation systems that have to be resilient, meet real time constraints, ensure integrity, security, privacy, and fairness. I was on a panel recently, uh, actually a couple of years ago, and there was this lady, a professor from University of Oxford, and she was talking about machine learning and bringing in formal methods, right? But yeah, that might be a good thing, but we need to understand, you know, we can't just bring formal methods for nothing. We need to, you know, we need to understand these problems and then see whether formal methods with temporal logic and so on would work, right? So the other thing is need to focus on developing AI security governance framework for transportation systems. So acknowledgements, very grateful to USDOT for funding the UTC on Tracer, and in particular, Clemson University and the director, Dr. Chowdhury, because without them, I would not be here giving this webinar. Uh, the tr Tracer team members, all the universities, you know, we've been working in a very cooperative uh, manner under the leadership of Dr. Chowdhury. And in particular for me, Dr. Murad Kantajulu and Latifa Khan, we work, we've been collaborating with each other on a number of projects since I believe with Latifa 2004 and with Murad 2005. So going into almost 19 and 20 years. And of course, Professor Alvaro Cardenas, he's the one who introduced me to transportation uh, systems uh, security in 2017, uh, because we had a joint, uh, we were co-advising a PhD student. And so, you know, he was a main advisor, and so he needed some of my support. So we got together. I learned about transportation system, and Dr. Raul Quinones, he's a PhD student. And then I'd also like to thank Ms. Rhonda Walsh. She's a project coordinator at UT Dallas. She provides excellent support for our work, and of course, our cybersecurity team at UT Dallas, uh, not just Murat and Latifa, although we work very closely, the entire team. Okay, so now I will hand it over to the moderator to see if there are any questions. And again, thank you very much uh, for listening to this uh, presentation. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Let's see. How do I stop sharing? Mm, okay. This. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and... Right, if there are any questions, uh, to just a second, all these things I've been looking at, sorry about that. Okay, so again, um, yeah, thank you, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, okay? Oh, sorry, tomorrow afternoon, thank you very much.